With Netflix's recent Baby Reindeer, there's been a lot of talk on the internet recently about stalkers. I'm Ana Yudin, I'm a doctor of clinical psychology and a fiction author, and today I'm going to talk about the psychology of stalkers. Specifically, I'm going to give you the two main reasons why stalkers do what they do and how those two reasons connect to each other, the mental health diagnoses that can sometimes be associated with stalking, and what I thought was important to note in Baby Reindeer. I'm also going to put some resources in the description box of this video if this is a topic that is personal to you. Obviously, we're not going to be able to resolve what you're going through in this video, and so I want to make it very clear that there are other resources where you can do so. This is really just a jumping off point to talk about the psychology of the stuff. It cannot fix if you have a stalker. What are the main reasons why people stalk? The main reason is power and control. Stalkers seek power and control over a victim. This can be kind of an umbrella for a lot of different types of stalking. A perpetrator of intimate partner violence who's upset that his partner left him could resort to stalking. Somebody who wants to assassinate a public figure like a politician could resort to stalking. A disgruntled former employee, a rejected lover. All of these are examples of situations in which people use stalking as a way to get power and control over another person. So that's the main reason why this happens. The second reason is something called erotomania. Erotomania is basically a delusion in which a person convinces themselves that they are romantically involved with someone with whom they are not romantically involved typically a celebrity or someone more high status compared to them, but not always. This can be a subtype of delusional disorder, which is exactly what it sounds like, a mental health diagnosis characterized by delusions of different kinds. What is a delusion? A delusion is the conviction that something is real, even when you have considerable proof that it is not real. You can have paranoid or persecutory delusions, meaning you think people are out to get you. You can have delusions of grandeur, that you are somehow an extremely talented person that deserves to be famous, even though so maybe your talent doesn't actually match up to that. This would be common in something like narcissism. You can have delusions of thought insertion, that somebody is trying to plant thoughts in your head. This is what we typically think of when we envision the tinfoil hat stereotype. Or you can have delusions of thought broadcasting, meaning you feel other people can read your mind, that your thoughts are being broadcasted to the world on the radio, on TV, on the internet, etc. So delusions can occur on their own as part of delusional disorder, or they can occur as part of a different psychotic disorder, such as schizophrenia. Psychosis is just an umbrella term for somebody who has lost touch with reality, who doesn't have reality testing. Psychosis is often associated with schizophrenia and schizophrenia-related disorders, but it is not the only time that a person can experience psychosis. It can also be present in episodes of mania as part of bipolar disorder, or even during very severe episodes of diagnoses that don't usually have psychosis, such as depression. Now, in schizophrenia, delusions fall under something that's called positive symptoms. This is a bit of a misnomer. They're not actually positive in the sense that they're good symptoms. There are positive symptoms which encompass hallucinations and delusions. There are negative symptoms like flat affect, low mood, and there are disorganized symptoms in a person's thought and speech. So in order to have schizophrenia, you need to have all three of these categories of symptoms. Not everybody who has schizophrenia develops hallucinations, it might be more common to see people experiencing delusions rather than hallucinations. And so it wouldn't be uncommon to find somebody who experiences schizophrenia and has delusions. Though they wouldn't always be erotomania, it could be possible. Now, the tricky part about delusions is psychologists as a whole have been trying to figure out how much is this person really conscious of the delusion? Delusions are a great piece of evidence for the conscious-unconscious schism of the psyche. My guess is that with people who experience delusions of this extent, their level of awareness fluctuates. Sometimes they might be able to consciously acknowledge, oh, this isn't real, whereas other times they might regress into, again, thinking that it's real. If a person consciously believes in the delusion, meaning they're not just lying, they truly believe it on the conscious level, it's just unconsciously that they realize it's not real. A lot of us feel a lot more tempted to be compassionate towards that person because we just see them as like somebody sick. We don't see it as their fault, you know, they're not choosing to believe this. They consciously believe this is the case. 
very difficult to work with. And it's kind of like trying to convince somebody that the sky is red when really they know it's blue. It would be really difficult to chip away at somebody's conviction for something that they believe so strongly. Delusions can be very rigid because it's this person's genuine sense of reality. And like I said, they might be consciously believing this delusion, but the unconscious always knows the truth. And the truth is probably hidden beneath layer and layer and layer, like peeling an onion. Layers of defense mechanisms, of projection, of denial. They need to be peeled very carefully and very gradually because otherwise this person might crumble if you pull off their defenses too quickly. The reason they experience delusions is because they cannot handle the truth. Their psyche is not strong enough. If you suddenly pull all the mantle off of their delusion, they could mentally decompensate. Now delusions can be, like I said, caused by a psychotic disorder, which means there's likely a misfiring, an organic neurological issue in the brain, but they can also be created by relational trauma. Somebody made this person feel like they're worthless, like, like they don't deserve love, probably very early in childhood when they weren't able to make sense of that experience. And they use these defense mechanisms to protect themselves, but over time they cease to be protective and now they are creating huge issues because this person has lost touch with reality. So the two main reasons why people stalk are a desire for power and control and romantic delusions. Now it's very rare that you will find one without the other. Even if you have romantic delusions about somebody, it takes a certain level of power and control to disregard the ways in which you are violating their, their boundaries and their privacy. It requires a lot of entitlement to sort of bulldoze past those boundaries. And most stalkers who stalk for power and control are former or current lovers or rejected lovers. So most people who do it for power and control also have romantic motivations, though not always. It is possible to have non-romantic stalkers, like in the case of somebody who's a political assassin, but like I said, it's much more rare. So we know the two main reasons why people stalk, but what are the disorders common with stalking? Notice I didn't say which disorders cause stalking because they do not cause them. There are plenty of people who have these disorders who do not engage in this behavior, and a mental health diagnosis is never an excuse for engaging in this type of behavior. There are just certain mental health diagnoses that may predispose somebody to the conditions in which they might choose to take part in this behavior, but it is still at the end of the day, a choice. So I've already touched on some diagnoses, particularly the more psychotic related ones. Schizophrenia and schizophrenia related disorders, delusional disorder, another psychotic disorder, or just psychosis independently. Now, another type of disorders where stalking can be prevalent, usually more from the angle of erotomania, are cluster B personality disorders, specifically borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, and narcissistic personality disorder. BPD is more common in female stalkers, whereas antisocial personality disorder, which is uh, psychopathy, is more common in male stalkers. Stalker who has BPD might be stalking because they need that attachment need met. It might be coming from this place of like clinginess and neediness, a need for attachment that borders on engulfment, that borders on swallowing the other person whole. A person with BPD feels empty unless they feel like they have that love being poured from another person. The moment they feel that that love is not being poured into them, and that could even be, you know, if the other person goes to work or if the other person doesn't text them back right away. You can, in some rare cases, get these escalating behaviors that can result in something like stalking. Now, in antisocial personality disorder, psychopaths might be more motivated by thrill-seeking, a desire to hurt the other person, to terrorize them, to make them afraid. And also, usually, the reasons why psychopaths stalk also co-occur with the reasons why narcissists stalk. Narcissists stalk because of self-esteem injuries, getting fired from a job, getting broken up with, getting rejected by someone. They cannot handle it. They feel completely worthless because their sense of self-esteem is completely dependent on other people and on external things, not from within. So they devalue that person in their head. And once they've devalued that person, made themselves out to be the victim, made the other person out to be the aggressor, they have this desire to avenge themselves, this self-righteousness to hurt the other person back. Or in some cases, they might just have a romantic delusion that they're involved with this person. They don't want to accept that this person wants nothing to do with them. Their self-esteem cannot accept that. It's too fragile. It's easier to convince themselves this person is just, you know, plain hard to get than to acknowledge this person doesn't want to be with me. So the diagnoses that can rarely 
result in stalking. Remember, not everybody who has these diagnoses is a stalker, very much not. Delusional disorder, schizophrenia, other forms of psychosis, BPD, psychopathy, and narcissism. Now, my thoughts on baby reindeer. So I think there are some questions floating out in the ether about whether baby reindeer is actually based on truth. From what I've heard, there are some parts that didn't actually happen in the real case that were sort of dramatized. So I'm just gonna take baby reindeer as like purely a form of art in this case. I'm not commenting on the actual people involved. I'm just commenting on what I saw in the show. One thing that I noticed early on in the stalking was too much, too fast. If you've seen my other videos on abusive relationships or you've been in the connection course, you know that too much, too fast or love bombing is one of the earliest signs of abuse. You give this person a little bit of attention and suddenly it's like a flip switches and they're suddenly extremely interested in you. They suddenly idealize you. They wanna spend all their time with you. They wanna move very quickly through a relationship and it can feel flattering, but it shouldn't be because it's not really about you. They don't really know you that well. It's more about their unmet needs and their problems. It's not about you being such a fantastic person. I also noticed possessiveness. Possessiveness is integral to stalking. Not hearing no, not accepting somebody, not wanting to be physically involved with you. This also relates to jealousy, you know, extreme jealousy where, you know, like commenting on photos of friends from years ago. Stalkers do not humanize their victims. They might think that they're in like a human romantic relationship with them. But at the end of the day, they have objectified this person because if they saw this person as a genuine human being, they would not do what they do. They see them as a means to an end. When you have possessiveness, disrespecting consent, objectifying and dehumanizing another person, of course, that is very rife for other far more serious things that we saw in the show, such as essay. It's very dangerous when a person does not hear no. Something else that I thought was interesting that was highlighted in the show was that both the stalker and the stalked want to feel seen, want to be important in somebody's eyes and feel lonely. And remember the definition of erotomania that I gave. Often it involves somebody who the stalker feels is superior to them. Usually in the case that they perceive this person as some sort of like public figure or celebrity who has fame and riches and glory and all that, but not always. Remember that the protagonist in Baby Reindeer is an aspiring comedian. He wants to be seen for what he is worth. He wants his art to be appreciated. He wants to matter because of his trauma history. Just like he wants that, the stalker also wants those things. I thought the symbolism of what the baby reindeer meant at the very end of the show was very telling. It really speaks to the trauma, the attachment to a safe object during childhood, and how easily this attachment to a baby reindeer, a stuffed animal, can be transferred onto a real life human. And remember what I said about how incredibly objectifying and dehumanizing stalking is. Comparing somebody to a stuffed animal, is that not objectifying and dehumanizing? And it pulls at our heartstrings because we know that this is an object that means safety and attachment and almost like a life raft to that person. But it's also very scary to be somebody's life raft. And lastly, I thought the show raised some good questions about the nature of delusion. You know, there was one point where the protagonist asked the stalker, you really believe it, don't you? Also, I thought it was interesting when he said to her, you pick and choose the bits you want to hear. Because I find this to be so common in certain personality structures, in certain people who are very deeply embedded in defense mechanisms. You could be speaking to them, giving your clear arguments, you know, trying to be logical and rational about it, they're not hearing you. They are answering to their own script of things. They are completely denying and discarding the parts of what you're saying that they're not strong enough to hear. You cannot communicate to somebody like that. They're just not going to listen. And I thought this was a little bit inconsistent with the stalker in the show admitting to the crime in court because that would reflect that by that point they admitted that it was a delusion, that they were taking part in stalking. And that doesn't really seem consistent with the level of delusion that was seen throughout the show. And now from what I hear, the real life story is not that the stalker ever went to court. So I guess that would make sense why that inconsistency exists in the show. Like I said, it can be very tricky to parcel how conscious is this person of what they're doing. Is this a delusion? Is this sometimes a delusion? Or are they very aware of what they're doing and they're just lying about it? 
What are your thoughts on this topic? I'd love to hear your comments. If you enjoyed this video, you want to see more content like it, hit subscribe, hit the like button. It really does help me so very much. Take care.